We are live. Welcome to the Book of Boba Fett, episode three through seven, if I can do them all, thoughts. I am, I, I binged the rest of the show, and I'm going to try to see if I can get all of these in the one sitting so that next week when we are dealing with Obi-Wan Kenobi, and I heard that the there are, the, the premiere is going to be the first two episodes, so I want to be able to devote as much time to that as, you know, yeah, because it looks like it might be really good. Anyway, this episode is called The Streets of Mos Espa. I appreciate the multiple turns in the scene with the petition of the watermonger. And Boba ends up hiring the mod gang because their attitude decides the watermonger is overcharging. I had already heard that the Tuscan would be killed, but it still got to me. And in a flashback, Boba comes across helmets from stormtroopers on spikes. So this is either Pike territory or there are Ewoks nearby. And I've seen some point out, you know, it looks like, you know, we, we see Pelimoto on the other side. It looks like she's headed to speak with Mando. And... Yeah, when Black K attacks Boba in his sleep, it's again a scene that exists to show off someone else's fighting ability. In this case, it's the gang. Why could Black K get all the way in there? I get the idea of having the gang fight him. What I think they should have done is have them attack him before he got close to Boba. And, you know, then you could have Boba still in the healing tank, which would explain why Boba wasn't fighting, instead of just having him lose the fight, which, like... I don't... Who wanted to see Boba lose one fight after another in the show that has his name in it? And it's so silly how Black K throws him over and over and somehow, like, he hits him, you know, K hits Boba with the electrical shock thing and it doesn't kill him and it's just down to the plot armor. And the choreography is also very meh. I will admit it startled me when he was attacked right of the back to tank, since we're used to it going better when he comes out of the tank. And the twins give Boba a new Rancor. They drive a one tough looking SOB like you would not want to get in a fight with this, you know. And I think he's there to train the Rancor. Seriously though, love Danny Trejo, love seeing him in more stuff. No surprise that Robert Rodriguez brought him in. Are you sure that was a good idea? It was either that or kill him. I have a sniper rifle. He's not that far away. I can still kill him. Please. So we find out that Rancor are actually emotionally complex creatures. A lot of people only think of them as good for fighting. So Boba sees some of himself in it. Honestly, I really thought it was going to have way more screen time than it ended up having. The car chase is okay, I guess. And the car chase ends with the mayor's emissary crashing. Melaroon fruit. I hate melaroon fruit. You don't have to apologize to me, mate. I paid a lot for this. I'm proud of it. This galactic, basic speaking, raccoon actually said he needed it for a plan. Steven Root was the watermonger. I knew I recognized him. And another episode directed by Robert Rodriguez. Again, I think he did better work on The Mandalorian. So, just like on The Mandalorian, we actually get a direct reference to the holiday special with Boba saying he's written things bigger than the Rancor. So, it seems like the end of this episode says there will be a gang war between Boba and the Pike Syndicate, so I think the plot has finally arrived. I would probably rate this episode 7 out of 10. I don't think it was necessary to have two episodes out of 7 both have an assassination attempt on Boba that proves that he was right to work with someone that other people might have told him he shouldn't work with and him not want the assassin killed and I certainly don't think that these two episodes should have been so close to each other. Of the three first episodes, two of them had very similar plots. 
So I forgot to mention this at the start, but I am putting time codes in the description box in case you don't want to hear about all the episodes. The so yeah, episode four. Episode four thoughts: the gathering storm. And here we go. The bantha licks its lips, so Boba feeds it, which really like they've come a very long way. For, like. At the st like in the old movies, they were like elephants in makeup, and now you know, like they they have a lot more expression. And we see Boba finding Fennec, taking her to the mod place to get her fixed up. And as I also mentioned in the review, it's, you know, Ming Na Wen apparently really geeked out about being on a bantha. The tool that the mod guy puts on is cool, but terrifying looking. Finnick Shan wakes up and is understandably not sure how to feel about the situation, waking up to a guy she's never met in a different place than she went out of it. And of course, seeing the machinery is upsetting. Boba is dead. I got better. If the armor is yours, why don't you just ask for it? Because they might say no. How many guards? I can't tell. It's time for a closer look. And she sends this little flying drone in to scout for them, which just really makes me wish I was playing Splinter Cell Blacklist. And the Bantha licks his face because it's going to miss him. And a little bit of them are like, there's too many of them, Sid. I like the robot chef that has multiple arms to more quickly chop vegetables and Turns out it can defend itself. It has a very General Grievous thing going on when it attacks. So the little robot is, I guess, the rat catcher. I like that at least some of the time it has a very stop motion vibe. And apparently Boba keeps it. And I like that it, like, <laughs> it's programmed to switch itself off in case of capture. Did not realize gonk droids exploded when you shot them. I might have to try that in some of the games. Very tense when he starts flying but can't see a thing and Fennec has to defeat a pig. She does a throw that would make Natasha Romanoff proud. Very cool when Boba guns down the bikers, although, you know, Fennec was right to point out bikers couldn't take out Tuscans, you know, and by by the finale, I forget if it's in the finale or before the finale, but yeah, you find out no, it was the Pike Syndicate, on account of the train robbery. Cool when the Sarlacc tries to eat them. I've seen some people justify that he forgot that, that he didn't realize about the armor. Because the acid hurt so bad, and some people say he should have been able to remember. I mean, it's it's kind of a cool scene, and this show could use more of those, so I'm okay with the justification. And Finnick has to disengage the seatbelt, but she does manage to reach the release button for the Sonic Charge that we also, also saw in Attack of the Clones and Season 2 of Mandalorian. Next time, don't touch my buttons. What you need is a back to tank. As someone who's played multiple Star Wars games, I agree with her. And Boba explains why he would rather be a daimyo than another bounty hunter, and it does make sense. I can offer you something no client ha ever has. Marzipan. 33 and a half minutes before we get any present day stuff in this episode. This would be one thing if this was the only episode to have a lot of flashbacks, but it isn't. Like, I'm not saying that you could do it, you you couldn't edit it to what I'm about to describe, but I think they should have realized when they were writing it that it was a bad idea. I think the show should just have had, you know, he, he comes out of the Sarlacc pit. I don't really have any issues with that, you know, the Jawas come and steal the armor, and then he, like almost immediately 
goes and finds Fennec. And yeah, they, they get the ship. And and yeah, it, it's really not necessary to see the whole thing with the like overall I did like the scenes with the the Tuscan, but you know, humanizing them was already done some in The Mandalorian, so you don't really need it for that. And it's just like if they if they put that out before we saw him like we know for a fact that at some point he's going to leave them you know we you don't necessarily guess that it's because they're dead but you know that at some point he's going to end up leaving them and actually yeah honestly i think it would have been stronger if yes tell you what i think he should have been with the Tuscans for a while. And then someone comes around and maybe doesn't... Maybe kills at least one Tuscan and is threatening to kill more. And Boba kills the, the guy and then realizes he wasn't here for the Tuscan. He was here for me. As long as I live with Tuscan, they're in danger. I have to leave them to protect them. You know, I think that would be much more compelling than just yet another revenge story. Or at least, maybe maybe it should have been that he wants to take revenge, but he realizes, yeah, have like the, you know, I want to, of course I want to, to take them out. But my family wouldn't want me to, something like that. Although I'm not entirely sure that they wouldn't, but, you know. And you see Black K watching gambling. I really appreciate that he legitimately seems to always be angry. Like, this is just his existence. Anger and pain because of all the years that he was a gladiator. Thwip tries to talk down Black K. It doesn't work. Black K tears off an arm and pays his tab rather than agree to not tear off the arm. And one of the guys asked Boba what prevents them from killing him, taking what they want. We get a brief appearance from the Rancor. I don't. I would have thought the pig guards and Black K or what should keep them from that. I abide. Well, there you go. The dude abides. I have plenty of credits. What I need is muscle. Credits can buy many muscles. And that brings us to the next part, which is episode 5 thoughts. This episode is called Return of the Mandalorian. Din Djarin is back. Badass return. I appreciate the detail that because Din doesn't have training in using the Darksaber, he accidentally cuts himself, and he talks the remaining bulldog aliens out of them fighting. Okay, so the title cards has the Book of Boba Fett, but the episode's title is the Return of the Man, Return of the Mandalorian. So they do realize that it's really more Mandalorian than Boba in this episode. Very cool circular city in space, and Din Djarin is all business. Without Grogu, he's back to his old ways. You know, he even said, "I can bring you in hot, or I can bring you in cold." like he did in the first episode before he started f being a father figure to Rogu. And he gets the information and he goes to meet his people. I, I quite like that the marks that lead you there are, like you have to have the, the in addition to knowing that you have to go there, you also have to have the, the helmet thing so that the, the vision mode is what I'm going to call it, you know, that allows you to see. And the armor explains the Darksaber is either a really good thing or a really bad thing. I think I understand why they call it the Night of a Thousand Tears. It's because Judgment Day was already taken. And right before the duel starts, they both take off their jetpacks. And Jarden admits he removed his helmet and is not a Mandalorian anymore. They do mention that there is something of a way to get back, but he says, like, you know, yeah, but that would be really difficult, so 
I don't, yeah, I mean, I could imagine that season three of Mandalorian is going to at least partially be him trying to gain that back. And Din has to remove all his weapons before he's allowed to fly. And uh, Peli Moto goes full used car salesman, but at least some of what she says does sound really good. I like that when the droid finally does get over there with the money, she sends it back because she realizes she's pretty much talked him into it and she doesn't want him to notice the money. Can you just focus right there? If you douse me again, I'm not on fire, I swear I will donate you to a public college. Long montage of them fixing the ship. You would think this was one of those shows where they have to fill a certain amount of time. And the Star Wars equivalent of a rooster lets us know it's dawn. Hey, watch your language around the customers. Besides, you don't have an ass for him to kiss. It's not turning over. Give it a little bit more juice. It's already had three boxes. I'm really worried it's going to go into a sugar rush. I think I heard at least one critic say they, the show spent way too long on them fixing up this vehicle. I'm inclined to agree. And the little child Rodian sees Din flying close by. One of the X-Wing pilots appears to be the same guy from Mandalorian show. Din escapes. And Fennec is willing to pay Din for muscle for Boba. He'll do it for free. Tell him it's on the house. But first, I have to say hello to my little friend. And, yeah. You know, I... I had guessed that the present for Grogu would be chainmail. And that brings us to episode six. And this episode is called From the Desert Comes a Stranger. Love seeing the Marshal stop the spice traders. And I I really love that he has his hands he has his hand on the gun like throughout the entire scene I really love the western vibe of this opening he knocked over the case I guess the spice must not flow I came to see the kid you are not the fan service I am looking for I like the ant robots Luke catches Grogu trying to levitate the frog in his mouth Grogu why that just cuts away from my close up and Luke levitates a lot of frogs. They all float, Grogu. They all float here. And the Ahsoka Tana Din scene and Luke training Grogu, they're fine scenes. I mean, they should have been Mandalorian Season 3. And, you know, the, the Luke scenes have the problem I'm gonna get into the problems with the Luke scenes it was a scheduled vacation actually can I kill him please my people don't want to fight no more don't they not want to use double negatives or no and the marshal does agree to a meeting I love the shot introducing Cad Bane so much, I want to marry it. And I, just, I love the whole build-up leading to Cad Bane meeting the Marshal. And who might you be? Didn't realize the Blue Man Group toured this far out. But you forgot your Cantuna. Massive explosion. Absolutely love that. This is one of those scenes that you can't come into direct contact with. I like to call these this these kinds of scenes the untouchables. And Luke gives Grogu a choice cliffhanger. Seriously though, if you haven't watched the untouchables. And that brings us to episode 7 thoughts. This episode call is called In the Name of Honor. We are at war. It was inevitable. Not the war, I mean, but that the show would eventually have a non-flashback scene that actually has consequences for a character we recognize. 
we see the mayor. I'm fairly certain at this point that Cad Bane is literally incapable of an entrance that is anything less than epic. I think I have an idea of how to draw Boba Fett out. It will be much easier than it could possibly be to compel me to open my mouth fully when I say a line. And Pelimoto sees an X-Wing, assumes it's New Republic, and we see it's sent by Luke. What do you have here? Mithril. As you can see, our flanks are covered. No one can sneak up on us. Again, we finally learned to prevent that. And they're immediately disproven anyway. And yeah, Rodriguez directed this episode. I guess he... He's just... His sense of humor doesn't always jive with Star Wars. Every time Cad Bane makes an entrance, he has to slowly raise his head with the hat having covered much of his face. I like to think that he just enjoys looking at his shoes until raising his head. Let's do this right now. Yeah, that'll definitely happen. And the locals are attacking. Good way to raise the stakes. And the train leaves. Multiple enemies are facing the pigs. Getting a distinct once upon a time in America vibe the West vibe, and I am loving it. They're both great movies, but I was specifically thinking of Once Upon a Time in the West. I think I, I, I liked most of the action in this episode. I really like when it's just Boba and Mando back to back, and a couple of reinforcements, and then giant robots show up. I think I saw at least one person say that there's too much of, like, Oh no, what now? And that I do kind of agree with. They, they kind of go... And that's again, Rodriguez has a tendency to just... I, I read a review once of Desperado where the person said that where John Woo will put icing of on the cake with his action scenes in his movies. Rodriguez seems to want the entire cake to be all icing and yeah. And Mando reunites with Grogu. The mechanic loses a tooth and has a gap tooth smile for the rest of the episode. Well, I can't say for sure, I feel like that was something Robert Rodriguez came up with. It feels like his kind of joke. And Boba is riding the Rancor and is able to take out the droid with help from Mando and Grogu. I like the King Kong thing that the Rancor has going at least some of the time. I appreciate that we're, even when the Rancor joins, the giant robots are not pushovers. Is that what you call hospitable? And then someone unseen starts shooting them and uses a wire to strangulate one of them. And here they thought they were just dealing with Star Wars characters. Nope, Leon showed up too, looking serious as ever. And we close on a good scene between Mando and Grogu rather than Boba, because the behind the camera people have given up trying to make us care about this Boba. And the post credits shows the Marshal in a back to tank. I it would be so frustrating if that was if this was how he goes out. Now I am going to go ahead and note the time code for this final section, I guess. I will just call it critics. So, critics. Now, all of the. I'm, I have a bunch. I have in front of me a bunch of quotes from critics. Some of them I agree with, others I disagree with, or am going to comment on. But if I just read aloud a critic thing, it means I agree with it. The show should have been about Cobb Vanth, the elephant character. And yeah, that that's actually from Nando V Movies' really great video rewriting the show, and the closer look one is also great. Boba Fett and others have way too much plot armor. Assassins sneak up on him all the time. Boba Fett is incompetent, loses almost every fight he's in, needs others to fight for him. Rodriguez is one episode of The Mandalorian was excellent for all three of his episodes for the show. Yeah, they go. All, they say that they're terrible. I wouldn't quite go that far. And 
yeah, the finale has too much slow motion. And this guy said, it feels more like Spy Kids than his Mandalorian episode. I'll grant that I only watched the first one, and it's been a lot of years since I watched it, but I... Okay, you know what, maybe it to, to some extent does, but I, I do like a lot of the finale. I did like a lot of the finale. Someone was frustrated about how the keep being told over and over that Jabba the Hutt was the ruler, then bit Fortuna until Boba killed him. We get it, shut up about it. I didn't really, that didn't really bother me. The only interesting episodes that are good are the last few, and it's because they're Mandalorian episodes. And some, you know, some people call them season 2.5 of Mando. Some say that this season 3, they're not really Book of Boba Fett episodes. They should just recast young Luke already. The main villain shows up way too late into the show, so there's barely, barely any buildup for the climax. The cyberpunk teenagers remind me of Power Rangers with their Skittles-colored Vespa scooters, even if it fits with Lucas's love of the car culture of the 50s. A lot of bland, uninteresting characters. There's definitely not enough interesting going on personality wise with Boba, same for Fennec Shand. Not enough time devoted to present day Boba, which only has 66 minutes, compared to the 92 minutes of flashbacks. And this critic said they're boring because we know how it will end. I didn't find them boring while watching them, but I, like, thinking back on it, I'm like, why did they spend so much time if all they're gonna do is just end up killing all of them and killing them off screen of that. I, I mean, okay, they had to kill them off screen because they wanted to hide who killed them. But just like... There is... In at least one of Sergio Leone's westerns, he has a character kill someone innocent and after that, the audience really badly wants that character to be shot by one of the good guys. Even though they didn't get a lot of screen time before, they, before the bad guy shot them. So I really think... And, and he's made movies that are three hours, four hours long. You know, so it's not like he's unwilling to spend time on... You, you really, we did not need to see this much if all they're going to do. Because that's, yeah, that's it. By the end of the show, essentially what it amounted to was when Cad Bane shows up and tries to provoke him by talking about how the Tuscans died. That's basically it. And Cad Bane has so little screen time and you could have done, you could have had Cad Bane be set up from the start of this show. You know, he could have You could have introduced him when we saw the train, for example. You could have shown him on maybe just silhouette or something, if they didn't want to give away that you know, you could do it where we only realize Ah, what's it called? In retrospect, we only realize in retrospect, oh, that must be Cad Bane, you know. But yeah, have stuff like that. So that when we actually meet him, it, yeah, you, you'd have people theorizing, that must be Cad Bane, look at his silhouette, you know. And then when he finally does show up, like, it also tells us, oh, so he knows about the Tuscan, you know, because he was on the train. And he was, you know, yeah, like when, when, when Boba finds the dead Tuscan, you could have like a far shot where you can just see, oh, there's someone standing there. And again, you know, just make sure that we realize in retrospect, that must have been Cad Bane. Now, let's see. Yeah, so, back to Greg's. 
this Boba Fett is nothing like the Boba Fett of the original trilogy. Now, maybe that is because he changed from his experiences with the Tusken. Honestly, it would be fine as long as he was an interesting character, but he isn't. He's way too squeaky clean. He's not an anti-hero like promised. Boba has way too few people to keep power. Way too much of the show is just Boba talking to people. We see the backstory of every single thing we see which Boba has in The Mandalorian Season 2. And these things did not need to be explained at all, like the stick he fights with. Now, I stand by. I I didn't mind that scene. I, if just... If you reduced the the flashback parts by a lot, like trim it down to maybe 10%. I get why the train is important. And I do think that the thing with the stick is also... Yeah, like just... Maybe you could have... I realize that it's a big part that they only gradually accept him. But one thing you could do was just have them accept him right away. Yeah, just, like, when they find him, you know, at first, like, yeah, so one, one of them wakes him up with the little thing in, in his mouth, and then he stands up, and at first they're like, wow, this guy looks like a pushover. He can barely stand on his feet. And so, like, they, they figure, okay, we're just going to leave him here. But he is following them. And so, like, their, their strongest warrior gets off the, I forget if they also ride Banthas, but gets off whatever he's riding, walks back there, and expects him to be a pushover. So at first, he's not even trying, and Boba can hold his own. And then he starts trying, and Boba struggles, but manages to win. And then the, the rest of the tribe accept him. Done. You, you don't need all that extra time. If all it's going to amount to, like... I really think it would have just, like, maybe, is it possible that originally that was how it was going to start? And then someone was like, oh, wait, we could put Boba in Mando season two. Because if, if the first thing, like, if let's say that Mando season two ends, and then there's a post credit scene, and you see Boba waking up in the Sarlacc, and then, like, the Book of Boba Fett coming uh, December or whatever it was, you know. And then the start of the Book of Boba Fett is him escaping. And, like, I stand by that I would trim, significantly trim the Tuscan stuff. You could have the, let's see. Yeah, have him catch up with Fennec really early. And then we get to the present day stuff. This this show did not need to be seven episodes. It really... Yeah. All the flashbacks are a run-of-the-mill revenge story. They have way too much running time, considering that's all they have to offer. Maybe because they were worried that the show would be too similar to The Mandalorian. They had to change some key aspects. But these were things that we really want for Boba Fett's return. Him wearing the helmet all the time. Being a badass fighter. Stoic. So little happens in the show in each episode. Yes, the effect of de-aging Mark Hamill is impressive, but it's also very obvious that they keep the shots of his face to a minimum. They have him speaking off screen, for example. And the scene would just come alive if it was just a young actor who could channel a young Mark Hamill. I have to agree. Like, I don't think that scenes that are nothing but special effects have to be bad. I don't think the third Sam Raimi movie is good, but the first scene where we see Sandman, it's all effect, and it is legitimately emotionally affecting. So I do think it is possible to do, but at the end of the day, like, we're just, we're watching... You know, this de-aged human actor, and then we're watching, you know, the, the puppet of Grogu, you know. And I don't, I don't think it's a problem that Grogu's a puppet, but I don't think it's a good idea to have him in scenes with other special effects that show so little emotion. 
you know, I, th I think it worked fine when the, I, I forget what the creature's called, but it's like levitating that creature that Mando is, you know, like losing against. I felt that that creature was feeling something, and I just, I get it. Zen, he's, he's the ideal Jedi at this point. So he's speaking very calmly, but like I said, when I did videos talking specifically about the prequels, that is not emotionally engaging for the audience to watch. It just isn't. And I think a strong case could be made that that kind of thing, like, if you want to write a textbook, if you think that people should live like Jedi in real life, and you write a textbook saying where it just says the ideal Jedi does not show very much emotion, and here's why, and here's how you accomplish that. Fine. I'm not sure I would want to live my life like that, but, you know, as long as nobody gets forced or tricked into it, that's fine by me. But it's, it does not make for engaging fiction. It really, really doesn't. And I think the fact that George Lucas in the original trilogy gave us very few Jedi and did make the ones we got, like... On occasion, like, Obi-Wan would say or do something that is, you know, that's kind of funny. Like, the look he, like, when Han Solo talks about the the Kessel Run, and you look at Obi-Wan's face and it's like, you have no idea what, what is it, Parsec. You have no idea what that word means, do you? You know, and, and like, when, you know, Yoda would always be like cracking jokes and and laughing and all this that you know before the prequels we really did not spend very much time with an ideal emotionless Jedi and I think George Lucas used to realize that it's just not in all that engaging to watch yeah and let's yeah um, the Pike Syndicate come across as weak. It's only at the end when we find out Cad Bane works for them that it's scary. Honestly, I had heard before watching that the Pike Syndicate would be the bad guys. And then when I saw the train thing, like by the end of that episode, the way that Boba seems to have really defeated the Pike Syndicate, I was like, hmm. Oh. I, I guess I was wrong. I guess I misheard or misremember. Maybe there's an Ike Syndicate or a Crike Syndicate or something. And I, you know, thought, oh, the Pike Syndicate. That must be, yeah. I mean, these are the guys that run the, the Kessel Mine uh, uh, mining operations with all those slaves. And then they're so, yeah, they come across as very weak in the show. Disney throws out the Expanded Universe and just repeats the biggest mistakes in the Expanded Universe. Ahsoka should have been the one Boba faces off against. Huh. I don't quite know how that would have worked. Anyway, it would have been interesting if Fennec turned against Boba halfway through the season. Someone suggested, you know, you could have her... Like, I th I th yeah, I think she says she's fine with Spice, and he says no, and she just kind of accepts that. And, yeah, someone suggested, wouldn't it be more interesting if instead of just accepting it, maybe she pretends to accept it and then backstabs him. Whereas The Mandalorian looks expensive, the show looks cheap. Way too much time spent on politics, on just people talking about the local crime. The reason that Fett is not an anti-hero is that Disney insists on their leads being heroes. They worry they can't sell toys of anti-hero or villains. The reason the last two episodes are Mandalorian episodes is because they ran out of plot for Boba. Part of the show is that Boba needs to find a way to break the circle of life that doomed his father and discover the tradition. That tradition can provide a sense of community and purpose. See, I agree with that reading. I just think it could be stronger 
in the show itself. Like when I really think I can I can see that in there. The biggest problem for the franchise is pandering. Something I like about the bike gang is its young people are alone and they just need somewhere to belong. That's like when Boba was younger and he doesn't want them to have to wait until they're adults to get that. I liked a lot about the first several episodes, but when Mando showed up, my opinion changed 180%. I will admit it's thematically consistent, but the fact that Boba Fett is not in the episode means that it doesn't land as well as it could have, because Luke's face and dialogue are limited and so handled by technology. It sucks a lot of the energy out of the sense he's in. The reason they show the that the show was set on Tatooine is because some fans are passionate about the planet because it's where Luke was from. The show is worse off for this pandering. It makes sense for Cad Bane to have the role in this he does have. I just wish he showed up sooner and was a villain for Boba Fett, not Din Djarin. What the show gains from the flashbacks where Boba spends time with the Tusken is that he learns to appreciate their culture and applies that to his life afterwards. Because Luke Skywalker's lines in this are largely made up of things that Mark Hamill said in radio plays and such from back when he was in the original trilogy. It means they had to find some that were vague enough that they could work for the show. So he'll say something like, the galaxy is a dangerous place. The direction of the show... Uh, let's see... Right, yeah, some of the... Robert Rodriguez directing for the show is in you know you, you see the kind of independent on the sheep run and gun style of filmmaking which doesn't work well for Star Wars they say that the spice trade is killing Tatooine people but we never really see it the finale reminded me of Power Rangers there are shots in there that the director thinks are way cooler than they are Grogu being back with Din barely has time to have an effect. The finale is in too much of a rush. So, yeah. I think that is everything that I wanted to say. If there's something that I didn't talk about in this video that you want to hear my opinion on, feel free to ask in the comments or, comments, or if there's something you want me to expand on or debate with me, you know, all comments are welcome. But yeah, so that is it for Boba. So next week it is time for Obi-Wan Kenobi to come back into our lives and hearts. So catch you then.